Hey everyone, welcome back. It's your favorite rappers in the game. I'm Jojo Juicy on the mic. And I'm McSnasty. <laughs> and welcome to our third episode titled No Place Like Home. Today we will be discussing the houselessness crisis in relation to indigenous and two-spirit and LGBTQ plus populations. Our guests today are us because there's nothing better than the original. (laughs) (laughs) But before we get into our conversation, we're going to have Jojo give a land acknowledgement. Hi, we want to make it especially clear for our listeners. We are guests on the island of Manahata, traditional lands of the Lenin and Lape, the Manahattan, the Canarsie, the Shinnecock, the Wappinger, the Regawonk, the Muncie, and the Haudenosaunee Nation. We want to take this opportunity to recognize the original stewards of the land. We hope this land acknowledgement helps people to think how they can actively contribute to centering indigenous voices and practices. Thank you, Joanne, or Judge of Juicy. <laughs> <laughs> So to start off with, we're going to discuss, well, we should, I should get some background, actually. Yes. <laughs> so, you know, Jojo and I have known each other for two centuries. So, <laughs> you know, we've seen it all. <laughs> Besides, you know, being like collaborators and best friends and, you know. And we do team. everything together. We're like attached at the hip. But one thing that we share, we share a lot of like lived experiences and similar we have similar backgrounds and lived experiences and one of them being we were both at one point or several points in my case houseless particularly in the bay area which is sometimes fluctuates it's sometimes either the second or the first area with the highest cost of living i think it's the first now beating new in, york yes by like eight dollars or so <laughs> I'm like, yay. I just read that. I can't remember the source that I (laughs) read that from, but it was a legit one. (laughs) We can find that information for y'all. But yes, it's super expensive to live in that area. And I was a teenager at the time that I experienced that. And Howell was... Going into my first semester at uh, undergraduate, um, so I was older actually. I was a transfer, you know, non-traditional student. So I was in my tw- mid twenties. I was twenty-five, so I was a little older, but in the same boat, without a place to call home. Yeah. So we both have experienced what being houseless is like, and uh, when we met each other. We ended up being roommates for a short time, and we just had a really good working relationship. And actually, Howell started working at the job where I work at, which is the California Indian Environmental Alliance. You may remember Sherry, our previous guest, who's the executive director. We both were commuting from Berkeley to El Cerrito, and for folks who aren't aware, Berkeley is in the Bay Area, but it also has one of the largest houseless populations. And just walking down the street, you just see tents upon tents pitched up on Shattuck Avenue, which is like a main street in Berkeley, like two blocks from the UC Berkeley campus entrance. And, you know, it's just disheartening to see so many people who aren't being able to find adequate shelter and and places to stay and it just keeps growing it's like tripled in the last few years uh so we want to really do something both being impacted by the houselessness crisis that's happening all over the country now at first it was really just like the larger cities but you're starting to see it like in smaller cities across the nation so we were like what can we do to help alleviate this problem and one of the things we came up with was that we really wanted to see a like all-encompassing 
type of center that is not necessarily, you know, it doesn't feel like sterile, like, oh, it's a whole processy thing. No, we wanted to create something that was very homey and welcoming for folks. And so we decided, like, we need to start a nonprofit organization to do this because we didn't see anything else really out there like it that offers that sort of like a setting. Don't get me wrong, there's tons of people doing great, great, amazing work around this, but we wanted something where they can come and like call that home. Um, so that's kind of what we decided and we picked a name and we called it Urban Resiliency. And then Howell so graciously <laughs> decided that they will do the paperwork because you know, I'm just like, whatever. I don't know how to do all of these things. Well, you were also starting your first year of your master's program. That's very true. So then you want to just jump in and talk about that? Yeah. I don't know what people think about the process of starting nonprofits, but um, it's not an easy one. <laughs> Especially when you have limited funds, limited resources in the sense that you don't know where to start. I'm sure there's, you know, you can Google yeah. and you can ask other folks who you're in community with that have been in the process. Um, Both kind of didn't know where to yeah, start. We didn't we know where to start. Like, we just were like, we're going to do this. Here's the name. <laughs> and then it's like, well, what do you do now? <laughs> so, you know, I went to good old Google and did a search. And there's a few that pretty much had the same kind of timeline and action items that needed to be done so I kind of just looked through a couple of those and ensured that they had similar information so that I'm not like forgetting a step um so you know choosing the name and deciding what to do is actually a really big part of it mm -hmm. because like after that the next step was drafting the article of incorporation of becoming you know a corporation or this entity we should say urban resiliency is this entity that it had a name and a mission, but we had to flesh that out within this Articles of Incorporation because they had to be sent to our Secretary of State, which Urban Resiliency is in California. So they had a template that, you know, you can work off of, but with templates, you then rework it to fit what your entity is. So Urban Resiliency, you know, became through these Articles of Incorporation pretty much set these rules and guidelines that would be guiding us as the founders, but also the organization as a whole, the board members that I'll talk about a little bit more, and then future people, employees, or interns, if we get to that level, you know, <clears throat> 10 years down the line, we're hoping, yes, this will be sustainable in itself. But they needed this framework to work off of, and this article of incorporation was that. We got that. Mm -hmm. Tell them what, what we were putting in there. Or, yeah, we wanted this all-encompassing type of organization, but like, what did that look like for us? Yeah, so I think that's a great question. We had, a, as Jojo mentioned, what did we want urban resiliency to look like? And as she was mentioning, down the line, we would like a center to offer services free of charge for folks. But... What did that mean? Like, what it uh, we what would be in it? What's the in mission? And so, the mission was pretty much thinking about ourselves and our identities as you know, indigenous and two spirit LGBTQ. We really members. wanted to we highlight wanted that to, those are the populations, as Jojo mentioned, highlight that those are populations that are afflicted by the houselessness crisis. Um, yes, other identities also are afflicted and our organization is inclusive of everyone, but we are trying to offer more culturally specific services towards Native and Indigenous folks because again, like I mentioned, there's really nothing out there like that, you know, working towards having something that's where they can call home and practice their cultures and also get full health services, I guess you can say, because what we envision being in the center, like we'll have a living communal space as well as a healthcare center, which would be 
offering all kinds of services, including mental health services, because that's something that we definitely want to acknowledge and highlight because going through the process of not having somewhere to stay can really take an effect on your mental health and definitely need to have that in there. Um, We want to be able to provide legal services in the same center. We want to be able to just kind of have like this one-stop shop, everything you need to establish yourself and be able to have what you need in that moment is what we're trying to do. So we want to serve your direct needs immediately, but also have it to where you can be self-sustainable in the future by offering even courses on, you know, financial literacy, all those kinds of things. So, yes. Yeah. So, you know, Urban Resiliency being this place where folks have the options and choices that they can still have their autonomy and decide, you know, they want these services or they just want a meal or they just want a fresh pair of clean clothes or stuff. Just a place where they could either call it home for long-term goals or to work towards becoming, you know, (laughs) self-sustainable, but also it just a place if you want to have a shower, have a haircut, you Mm -hmm. know. Yeah, we're planning on doing, like, different, like, pop-up events, like um, a makeover day, like, if you want to get a haircut, get your makeup done, I do makeup on the side, not professionally whatsoever, but... I'll be the main person doing that. Uh, (laughs) And yeah, just anybody who wants to like provide those services, like everything's not fully fleshed out as of yet because it's still very much in the beginning stages. But our long-term goal over time is to have a facility where we can do all of this. And we're hoping to achieve that within like three to five years. But in the meantime, we'll definitely still be offering a lot of the services that I mentioned that doesn't require you to be in one spot. And that's pretty much all of them besides the actual like shelter portion of it. So that's kind of where we're at. But just to kind of pivot back to the whole reason of why we started and why we chose these populations, um, I was a teenager identify as a Native American woman. I am an enrolled member of the North Fork Rancheria of Mono Indians of California. And I, let's say, didn't agree with my mother all of the time. And that really put a strain on our relationship um, to the point where I wasn't able to stay in her home. Not by choice, (laughs) but Yeah, so there was a period of time during my teenagers, what, 16? And I didn't have a place to go. And I was, like, living with friends or my partner from time to time. But young relationships, how that goes, you get in an argument, you know. So I was kind of, I guess you could say, couch surfing. And at some points with no place to stay at all, like somebody's mom wouldn't let me stay or... You know, I wasn't getting along with my partner. Our family didn't let me stay. So it was a really tough time. And then also being pregnant during that time, which I unfortunately had a miscarriage. But yes, so it was really stressful. And I think that kind of contributed to me having that miscarriage. So it was... It was hard and I think that is still very like relevant today in my life like that that portion of it and then when I met Howell and then hearing their side of their story it just was like you know like this is a problem especially as teens experiencing that or or early adulthood um you don't have financial support you and there's really like yes there's these social services like I'm a social worker or will be soon after I graduate from this program (laughs) but there aren't social services like everything requires you to be 18 or older or has all these kind of like red tape and and certain stipulations in order for you to be able to even get anything so really all you can go to which they didn't really have 
at, in my area that I knew about at the time were like food pantries and things like that. I didn't know where to go. I had no clue. And that's the other thing too, is being able to know where to go if you find yourself in a situation of, you know, not having somewhere to live or food to eat. I think that's one of the biggest things too, is because yeah, there might be services, but how is the word being put out there to reach people? And I think that's another goal of ours is to really market ourselves. Like that sounds weird to say market ourselves, but like to really put our nonprofit out there so people know like, hey, we're here and, you know, there's no requirements, no certain discriminations. Obviously, we'd have to work that out with state. Like what are the requirements, especially for serving um, youth under the age of 18? Like there are certain situations, but also at the same time, still being able to provide what these folks would need. So that's kind of like why we for sure wanted to start this. And then I don't know if you want to go in a little bit about your story. Yeah. So thank you for sharing that. Um, so my story. Um, oh, great. I know. I was like, oh my God, it's getting emotional. <laughs> um, my story, I was born and raised in Southern California. When I got accepted into Berkeley, uh, that was the school I was going to choose and um, at the time, my mother was still alive, and she, you know, heard of all the schools I got into, and we talked it over which school I was going to go to. And after doing, like, campus tours and, you know, which I had the privilege of being able to do, I just knew I wanted to go to Berkeley. I SIR'd or whatever, submitted my statement of intent to register. And it was, like, one of the happiest months of my life, you know, being first generation. Um, and then... Then my mom passed away right after that, and I wasn't working at the time, and my partner was working full time, and it was a lot. That took a toll. Um, I don't think I realized it then how much a toll it took on me. I did have a support system, luckily, but it was kind of sudden, and even though she was sick, she was getting better, and that was just kind of sudden, and. We didn't have no financial means to bury her and provide and, you know, have services for her. So luckily, you know, my family, like my grandparents, my uncles and aunts, my mom's siblings and my brothers and I, we all pulled together and, you know, we had some help from family, friends and stuff and it made it happen. And then, well, then it was like settling her estate. You know, she had a house, I think between the three of us, my brothers and I, we decided, you know, financially we wouldn't be able to keep the house myself going to Berkeley my youngest brother who was working full-time part-time and then my brother who's in the army who had a family so there was that and that there was that also burden and then getting ready to move and before I trans uh when the year because Jojo also went to Berkeley they were on a system before called telepath telebears Telebears. They were in a different system that is different from the one now they use, which is Cal Central. And my incoming class was the class that was transitioning like into the Cal Central. class yeah. of Cal Central. I like Cal Central, but um, because they were transitioning systems, paperwork were taking a lot longer to process now. And I think one of the one of my papers was holding me up, which I, I had sent to them, but it hadn't been processed. And it was uh, like proof that you're registered to vote. That was like one of, yeah. What? Yes. <laughs> and I sent it, and it still wasn't cleared, and the time was getting closer for me to move from Southern California to the Bay. My partner had put in his two weeks. We were getting ready to move, and still wasn't. And then, you know, the day came, and we had no choice. We were ready to move, and I was depending on this financial aid package that they had, you know, offered me to go to school, and... So with like $600, I think, we just packed our car, drove to the bay, and... It's nothing. You yeah. can't even rent a single room in someone's no, house for $600. No, that was nothing. And we, yeah, we drove, we made the drive, we parked. There's a few locations we parked. Uh, we ended up sleeping in our car most of the time, and then we would get a motel room 
here and there, to, you know, to shower because my partner was in the process of looking for a job. I was going to school, couldn't go to school, all stinky and stuff. <laughs> so eventually I took the paper to the financial aid office and like, here it is. And they processed it and there was still a wait for me to get my financial aid and I ended up getting it and we ended up using that to get off the street. But I didn't know that there, you know, like you mentioned, there's these resources. One of them at Berkeley is that they can give you the deposit to your apartment that you're going to end up renting. Didn't know about that. If I would have known about that, this probably would have been was avoided. It, was it there at the time that you... I don't even know if it was there I at the time. Know. I don't I, it's think... It's there now, but it might have not been there I at the time. I don't think it was. Or it was uh, hush, hush. Because it wasn't really until, like, I think, I want to say Ruben in... Uh, he works at Berkeley. I'm, his last name's slipping me. But, like, started doing a whole bunch of stuff around that. And that was happening while really? I was there. But I'm not sure. Can't see... I didn't use it. No, Luckily, at that way. time, I didn't need help. But I think that's that's the issue, again, is that we don't know about these services. And forgot to mention, I am from Richmond, California, born in Oakland, raised in Richmond. Yay area! <laughs> but, like, I only knew Richmond my whole life. I didn't know anyone outside of Richmond. So I stayed in Richmond during the time that I was, you know not having anywhere to go. So both of our experiences happened in the Bay Area. And that's why we chose to start Urban Resiliency in the Bay Area. Not simply just because, oh, it has a large houseless population. No, we both have experienced being houseless within that area. And Mm -hmm. it's just problematic you know, I was a teenager, you were a young adult, like you're still trying to navigate, you know, it's scary. You don't know. You moved from a whole nother city. I was (laughs) in my own city and still didn't know obviously enough people to (laughs) let me stay with them. But like, It's just crazy to think about this is just two cases Mm -hmm. in what is so, 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 so many. And, you know, understanding that like fear and that's, I think, one of the biggest reasons because I could still to this day, I don't know about you, remember how I felt like not having nowhere to go. I was so scared, even though I come off like super tough and like, which I am, <laughs> like, you know, that's something that's different compared to not having a place to live versus, you know, being tough with everything else. Yeah. You know, that's a whole security thing at the end of the day. Like, you just don't feel safe in wherever you're at. Like, my case, sometimes I just stay up all night because I wasn't going to fall asleep outside. Like, I'm not going to do that and get robbed of my, like, few little things I do have. Like, it's it's really scary. Yeah, I remember being, like, yep, yeah, terrified of what if people find out I'm homeless. Mm, like, mm-hmm. so, you know, my first semester at, like, especially the beginning at Berkeley, I felt so alone. You know, being without a home, living in my car, kind of like you said, we were able to find spots where we could park and, you know, kind of sleep, but it was, like, what if like the cops found us mm-hmm. and they'd be like why are you sleeping in your car it's like what do you they'd be like oh and we weren't sleeping in our car but then you see all our shit packed mm-hmm. in the back and it was more like i was scared of, especially like coming from a port system and my family all back in southern california to a, even though it's in the same state like it was like like southern california and northern california are so different when you're taken out of your comfort zone and your support mm-hmm. system it's like yeah, that instinct to survive. Either you fight or you're going to fly. Like, mm. what's what's going to take over? And sometimes you do want to just run away and fly, you know, but you can't. Like, I mean, I could have just been defeated and went back home and be like, you know, yeah. I'll just transfer to yeah. somewhere closer. And I was like, no, we, I got to figure this out. We moved. We're both here. And I had a, my partner. We both had to think about each other. I think that was great that you had at least that one person there. Like, yeah, I could still feel very lonely, yet at the same time, you had somebody who can help you at least with food or something. Like, if you're hungry, like, maybe they got something. Like, you're not having to go, like, search and not know where it can come from or, you know. I just think that overall, the experience is very scary for folks. And we're hoping to be that resource when we get to that point that, 
you know, we become not a household name because we don't want that to be a thing. Hopefully one day urban resiliency really do- doesn't have to exist, to be honest, yeah. right? That's the, <laughs> the main goal over time. But to be known enough in a current state of which we are, which is, it's a big problem, to be known enough that people can just be like, you know what? I don't need to worry about where I'm going because I I know I can get here and at least be good for some time. Like, I know I can shower. I know I can eat. I know I can go get tested. Or even if it's a case of, like, I'm on the verge of being evicted, like, I can get Mm -hmm. legal assistance, you know, anything like that. We just hope to be a resource in the future for people who might have went through the same type of situations that we've experienced. And, again... The particular communities we're choosing is because we identify within those communities. And so it's another added barrier. It's not so easily like if I was a white woman or white man, I probably could get resources from somewhere else. And that would have never been a thing. But no, I'm a native young woman with no education at that time because it's Richmond (laughs) <laughs> school district <laughs> education you know just being young in general I worked since I was 16 too but there was no way I would be able to live off of that it's like impossible and then like what you're talking about brings up two things that popped up to me mm-hmm. one being like resources are either stretched or limiting like you can only stay in one shelter for a specific amount mm-hmm. of time or exactly. sorry we ran out of food and things like that or the kitchen's closed yeah. at, at a certain time or there's a, a curfew no oh my god um, yes i know out here in new york there's curfews on their shelters and a lot of them are and and i get it because maybe they don't want to disturb other people but that's the point is to get to a place where maybe there's not a whole bunch of people sharing a space that's the other thing too is like space is limited in these larger Mm -hmm. cities so thinking about all of that kind of stuff but just making it to where those particular things aren't an issue what was the other one the the other one was thinking about systems of oppression that are in place Mm -hmm. and thinking about like the classism the racism Mm -hmm. the homo or transphobia and all these other isms or phobias that arise because of misconceptions or stereotypes and then like for like native people a lot of it's like well either they get money from the casino Mm -hmm. or they're substance abusers and all these other things but it's like you don't talk about colonization and the systems in place that have displaced them and put them in precarious situations that there's no way really out because colonization has made it hard for all native people on their own excuse my french but fucking lands especially like with houselessness like there's so many structures that are empty that yes. can be used by the city like this is the place we to stay buildings. like we saw with the pandemic people without homes were allowed to go to hotels or motels because of the whole and then those are other issues that come out from being in this pandemic like you said space is you know limiting if mm-hmm. you're in a tight space it's a lot easier to be exposed to you know health, getting health there's health being like covid yeah right. something that's spreadable <laughs> so that's a little bit of our story <laughs> and i think that you know there's obviously a bunch of work there's gonna be a lot of partnering we'd have to do I'm sure there's going to be stakeholders probably trying to go against us for sure. Mm-hmm. Probably big corporations, whatever the case is. It's always it's always going to be something that we're prepared for that. Our, our goal is to be fully functioning with a building, maybe several, hopefully, within the next three to five years. So, yeah, anything else you wanted to add to that? Yeah, I think, as Jaja mentioned, you know, we have all these big ideas and not that they can't happen, but right now a lot of it's limiting because mm-hmm. we're not a nonprofit. Um, we don't have five hundred one c three status yet. We did submit our papers. our paperwork to the IRS for federal tax time. exemption, and yeah, it's a long process. And most of our work right now has been sending what letters of support for other causes. Yeah, other causes, but they relate to the work we do yeah. because. I think a lot of the, as you mentioned, we want also, you know, the cultural aspect within Mm -hmm. urban residency because culture, land, and our 
community, you know, those are all integral to people. I mean, for indigenous people, yes, but I think for mm-hmm. most communities, especially BIPOC communities, like yeah. a solid foundation shows that, you know, it helps with, like they say, it takes a village to raise a, a child. That is true. It takes a community to build up each other. And yeah. so we've been doing our letters of support for various issues, like renaming Sumac Park, Yurok Territory, that past that originally was named after a colonial genocidal figure Mm -hmm. to now reflect the name of one of the sites in that territory. But there's been other letters we wrote in support and that's within our means um, that we can do with limited funding because we are both students and we work part-time, but you know, it sucks. We do live in this capitalistic society. And I remember my parents would tell me growing up in Spanish, like, bills never stop like bills continue <laughs> and it's yeah. because you know this structure is hurting all of us and, and so we dismantle it and get rid of it you know we have to work within it i hate it was just saying that it made my like look, cringe yeah like my tongue like if i like had something bitter right and as always we like to leave you all with actionable items that you can do to support the topics that we discuss in this podcast. And one of the ways we were thinking about, you know, advising you all to do is definitely go to your local city halls and when they're having meetings about buildings being built and anything, talk to them about how, if it's a good or bad idea, because like most of the times it's often not because it displaces a lot of so low socioeconomic people So just consider that and definitely advocate for that. Um, And like you had mentioned to. Oh, yeah. You can like, you know, donate canned goods, non-perishable items, um, clothing, clothing, especially in the winter. Yeah. You know, any clothing you're not wearing, you can donate them to shelter or partner with organizations that are doing this kind of work. Right. um, Because not all organizations out there are doing the work that they're saying (laughs) right make sure it's one that you have uh definitely researched and and, and done (laughs) your due diligence to ensure that if you're donating like monetary funds like that's for sure what they're doing with it um also along the lines of donating like you don't even necessarily need to donate directly to an organization you can you know go out and do the work yourself if you Mm. want to like cook meals and give to some folks every day obviously don't just assume like you'd be like hey i have some food would you like it like just don't just go hand it to people because some people aren't comfortable with taking handouts or what they consider to be handouts and things like that or you could also check with your local restaurants and markets mm-hmm. and grocery stores and ask them what they do with food that are close to expiring or leftovers a right. lot of they i i mean we see it all the time the u.s is very wasteful wasteful and spend so much and have so much surplus and then it goes to waste and instead of it going to waste it can go to like like jojo says local shelters or, or if it is in the means you could also give it to like some people like you said some people don't don't like to be given mm-hmm. things, but some people do. Some people definitely it do. Just, it just depends. You know, just think about safety of not only yourself, but also the person right. that you're in coming in contact with. Right, right. There's several ways you can get involved. Advocacy is very good as well. Like anything just to aid in combating this, because at the end of the day, we're all people and we all deserve to have just our basic needs met. And being sheltered is one of those needs. You know, the the cold air, especially in places like New York, that has, like, seasons like that, right? Like, it has snow. It has super hot summers. Like, oh, yeah. Like, with Southern California, you know, Arizona, Texas. Yeah, like, like it's extremely you hot. You know, you, you need to be able to either escape the heat or get warm for the winter. Just that going without shelter is just not okay for anyone so just you know be a good human at the end of the day and do what's right and try to do your best to stop contributing to this or to stop others who are contributing to this so just want to thank you and we appreciate you for listening and please follow us on 
I mean, you can follow our personal IG. That's <laughs> another actionable item. If someone knows how to do web design and <laughs> wants to help out a burgeoning nonprofit, like we were very we, early stages. We, yes, like we were, you know, my my friend here is about to start law school. I'm going Yay. into my second year of my master's. Like our time's very limited. I'm gonna be working on a thesis next year. Judge is going to her first year of law school. So any help, you know, to <laughs> lift us up because we... It'll yeah. look good on your resume. Was, yeah, and you just get... remember, we are not have received our 501c3. And so we don't have any money to pay you. So if you would like to volunteer. Ho- hopefully, <laughs> maybe by the time you help finish this, maybe we might. We have might, some funding, hopefully. Or we can, Comes you through know, quick. You know, I would ask folks to donate to us. But, you know, you won't get 501c3 status. <laughs> yeah. It won't be tax exempt, but... Um, but you could follow us on our own Instagrams. We can, you know, share those in the in the links yeah. below. Mine's is at Jojo Juicy Zero Three on Instagram. Mine's is Mix M X underscore Nasty N A S S S T Y um, on IG, and which is funny because that's our rap name that we mentioned earlier. Yeah. <laughs> But um, yeah, thank you for be you know being on this journey with us. Um, from our first little episode to our third, we hope to continue this in the future and bring you more fabulous guests and more ways you can center Indigenous voices and people and, and more great content and some actionable items for you to be a better ally. Thanks. Bye. Oh. That's That's a wrap. wrap.